Welcome to the Penny Stamps Distinguished Speaker Series. My name is Christina Hamilton, the series director. Today, we continue with the second installment of our fall series and our fathom theme aligned with both of its meanings, one of thoughtful understanding and the other as a unit of measurement equal to uh, and based on the human arm span, which was standardized to six feet. So considering fathom further this past week, I had a realization that a fathom is also one measure of social distance where we find ourselves now. So though we must stay a fathom apart, we must continue to fathom together. Today, we bring you thoughts worth fathoming from creative engineer, artist, and designer, Dr. Kate Stone. She shares her work and perspective around something we all need very much right now, sensory experiences. Dr. Kate has spent the last decade on a journey of discovery from the world of science to creative design. Her focus on moving electrons eventually led to the creation of her groundbreaking company, Novalia, where she has developed a new technology platform to create products that are a delightful blend of magical, old fashioned and futuristic. Dr. Stone believes the future will look more like the past than the present due to our natural mix of nostalgia and futuristic stargazing. At Novalia, she and her team use ordinary printing presses to manufacture interactive electronics which combine touch-sensitive ink technology and printed circuits into unique and cost-effective products. Most recently, she and her team have created experiences for large brands, advertising campaigns, working with Pizza Hut, McDonald's, Budweiser, Hershey's, and Ikea. They're presently working on a children's toy called Touchscape that connects to Amazon's Alexa. Dr. Stone has a degree in electronics from Salford University and a PhD in physics from Cambridge University, but believes the most useful things she learned in life were discovered during her travels through Australia and Asia, and in particular working on a sheep farm in the Australian outback. While she sees herself as a creative scientist, she's blending art and science to create startling fusions of new and old technology. She asks us to consider what future world do we want to build? What is our mind? Do we need technology at all? How can we build resilience into our everyday life? True to her nature, Dr. Stone is tackling the complexity of the moment. In particular, the digital presentation format we now find ourselves relegated to. She has crafted technology in her studio to allow her to explore new ways of making a live presentation. We join her now in her studio laboratory in Woodstock, New York. Over to you, Dr. Stone. Hi. So before I begin, um, I'd like to explain what you're about to see. I'm kind of exploring how can I tell a story without being on stage because, well, for now, we can't go on a stage. And the stage just doesn't seem to translate well to screen. And I'm really bored of Zoom. And then I wondered, when cinema was invented, did people say, oh, it's, it's just not the same as the stage and nobody has the attention span to stare on a screen. It, it, it just won't work. But then I thought for 80 years, television has glued eyeballs to screens and arseholes to couches. So I set myself a challenge to explore how can I use a format more synonymous with live TV rather than trying to recreate the talk I might do on a stage? Because, you know, even the best Broadway show doesn't become the greatest thing to hit a screen. So it's kind of an experiment. Um, so working on this format and um, things need to be trimmed down. Um, and I'm sure something will go wrong because it always does. <laughs> um, and what I'm trying to do is I, I wanted to bring the energy um, of bringing you live into my creative studio, combined with the ability for me to drop in any digital media I need just by tapping my keyboard, which is down here. And so my goal is to, is to tell a story in a way that I never could from the stage, that's, that's hopefully better than being there. And just so you know, if I look here, then I've been distracted by my monitor and probably checking my hair. Um, if I look here, then I'm looking at my camera, at you, as I should be. 
Um, and if I look over there where the window is, then I've possibly been distracted with the creatures that come to my window. Um, I think that's a groundhog. Um, and yes, that beautiful, beautiful, beautiful creature does come to my window sometimes, which is quite exciting and very scary. So anyway, let's begin. Hi, I'm Kate. Welcome to my studio. I describe myself as a creative scientist and my team and I at the company I founded called Novalia try to add a little magic and connectivity to everyday objects. And so most of the things around me do a little more than might first appear. Um, and I'd love to show you one of my favorite posters. It is an intergalactic alien music remixing rap battle. We created this for a music studio in Brooklyn called Ant Food. And when you touch these spots here, it triggers the sound loops. And then the characters rap. <laughs> um, I'm ashamed to say that my favourite noise um, is the air horn. <laughs> anyway, enough of that. So we create we create things like this um, in the physical world with agencies and brands with a goal to make people stop in their tracks and experience something that might trigger emotions such as surprise, delight or wonder or awe. And I, I'd love to share some more of those things that my team and I have developed over the years. But first, I'd like to explore with you why I do what I do and explain how playing with technology as a child, failing high school and becoming a sheep herder turned out to be the perfect education um, for me. And later, I'd like to discuss how my curiosity took me on a search for a better understanding of humanity's relationship with technology, to question if we need technology at all, and ask if making life easier actually helps or hinders our mental health, relationships, and environment. I've also been trying to wrap my head around what's the, who we are, and what's the difference between brain and mind, and how can I increase my chances of surviving the zombie apocalypse, <laughs> but more of that and a little bit of my ham radio later. All right, I was a strange child and I can remember running wires under the carpet in my bedroom, up the walls, then connecting speakers, switches and microphones, and then hiding in the loft space, calling out to my siblings and confusing them as my voice appeared to come from behind the bookshelf or under my bed. Um, I told you I was a little strange. <laughs> I can also remember taking one of my dad's favourite books, which I think was Captain Hornblower, carving out the inside to place a radio transmitter that I'd built from a kit I found on the back page of a magazine. I hid the book near my parents, crept off to my bedroom, tuned in my radio to eavesdrop. I heard things I can't unhear, um, which I will leave to your imagination. And it turns out it's more difficult to unhear than hear. But looking back, I realize now I did these things more because I could, kind of driven by curiosity and a desire to allow everyday objects to become magical and connected. And I've always been particularly inspired with the idea of modifying what we have around us in subtle ways to alter our experience or perception of reality. And another childhood moment that stuck with me is when my grandmother said, cut your coat from the cloth at hand. And that advice has stuck with me and somehow found its way into nearly everything that I do. So I spectacularly failed high school um, and my parents bought me what turned out to be a one-way ticket to Australia. So 
I'm not really sure if it was punishment for the trick with the radio or, <laughs> or even if they ever knew about that, but off to Australia I went. And for three years I worked on various farms and factories. And for two of those years I worked on and off on an 120,000 acre farm with 22,000 sheep in far western New South Wales. I got the job by lying that I could ride a motorbike, <laughs> um, and of course I never had. <laughs> and working on that farm, it taught me a lot about resourcefulness and resilience. And also that preparedness calms and panic kills. And there were times when a simple decision could have cost me my life whilst working in the desert on my own in the extreme heat. You had to, you had to make do a mend and think on your feet and keep your wits about you. And, and I, I learned to ride that motorbike by falling off it every single day that I rode it. Though to be fair, we were mostly off-road, um, up and down some really steep ravines, jumping over the occasional creek and avoiding unmarked mine shafts. There really was one paddock that had unmarked mine shafts in it. And my job every day, we would be moving sheep. And I learned that sheep don't do what you want them to do if you just try and make them. You have to really know the lay of the land, where the water is, the fences, and the noise that you make. And in this way, you can let the sheep do what you want them to do, allowing without commanding. So after a year of traveling home through Asia, I managed to weasel my way in to a university. Um, and I worked hard with a determination um, to earn a first class honors degree in electronics. And when I did, it opened up a whole new world to me. And I was then offered a funded PhD in physics at Cambridge. My PhD was to move electrons one by one. And I quickly realized that those electrons were very similar to sheep. And to move the electrons, I patterned silicon wires just a few nanometers across. And at a temperature of a few hundred degrees Celsius below freezing, applied a voltage across the nanowires. The electrons would jump along the wire one by one. And using a sensitive circuit, I could watch them go by. And again, this was allowing without commanding. So this is when I started to realize how much our environment affects our every decision. So after my, um, to the present really, so after my PhD, I worked at a university spin out creating ways to print circuits of plastic transistors. And four years later, I left totally inspired with printing as a manufacturing process. Print's the most pervasive manufacturing process in the world. It's in every city and it's even in our homes. It's also the most pervasive user interface from curtains to clothes, carpets, walls, packaging, and even the keys on the keyboard. And I wondered if it was possible to print conductive ink onto everyday items to add a layer of interactivity. And yes, I was met with many naysayers. So looking back as a scientist and engineer with admittedly limited artistic capability, my first hire was a new graduate called Maria. Now, I've always wanted user experience to outshine any technology I create, kind of similar to when I was a child with those wires in the bedroom. And I remember 15 years ago, in order to free myself from my academic's ego, I set myself a goal to develop technology that my scientist friends would look down on, pour scorn on, and laugh at. I wanted to trigger human emotions, and I wanted to take people on playful journeys that surprise and delight. So Maria designed a birthday card where I'd ask her to be heavy on the line art. And I would then go into Photoshop, delete little sections of the line art to allow the current to flow through the graphics in invisible ways. And when you picked up the card, you accidentally touched the flowers printed from silver ink 
causing a microcontroller to be triggered, which in turn sent a current through the silver line art to the LEDs that we placed on the tips of the candles. The candles would then flicker, and then if you blew on the cupcake, the moisture from your breath was sensed between the printed tracks, which caused the candles to go out and the speaker to play Happy Birthday. <laughs> it's kind of creating this, this journey or user experience. So um, let me show you how we create things now. So we've moved on from using the conductive ink flowing through the silver um, to creating these stickers that add capacitive touch and this goes behind a graphic. So I'll show you a little bit over here. So here you can see conductive ink printed on a sticker so it's actually sticky on the reverse when you peel this off and then this is carbon ink and then we print an adhesive over the top and then we would laminate a graphic over the top so all you would see similar to that poster that I showed earlier is a beautiful graphic and then we've designed these circuit boards so they have a microcontroller on this is a Bluetooth microcontroller and they have large pads on the reverse and then this board just presses onto the back behind where these pads are and the pads on the circuit board form one half of a capacitor that projects a field through the adhesive through the paper and into the conductive ink and these pads form the second half of the capacitor so it's two plates of a capacitor and that causes voltage pulses one by one to go down these conductive ink tracks now if someone's hand is near or touching the graphic it changes the capacitance which changes the time it takes for that voltage pulse to come back by a few tens of microseconds and the microcontroller which is sending the signals one by one and measuring um, the time the delay time can detect that change and so it knows what you've touched and when you touched it and then that Bluetooth's off to a smartphone or a computer what's been touched and then you have some kind of experience We've also created this module, same pads on the reverse, but this time it has an audio chip and a connection for a speaker and a connection for a larger battery pack. Um, so this is the one that plays the sounds and this is the one that does Bluetooth. So that's how we make that. Um, yeah, so it's just a sticker and a circuit board and it's really easy to put together. This is something um, we made for DJ Qbert. So I did a talk a bunch of years ago where I DJed on some paper and um, then Qbert saw it and said, can you put paper DJ decks into my album cover? So these are paper thin DJ decks. You can um, scratch, crossfade, um, um, go back to the cue point, play and stop, drop some sound effects, drop it into a loop. Of course, it has the air horn on there so I can drop some air horn noises. Um, um, well, I tell my kids that on paper I'm the best DJ in the world um, and because I'm the only DJ on paper and also that I travel the world and DJ to thousands of people. Um, I'm not really a DJ. I DJ for 30 seconds using this whilst I'm doing one of my talks um, and I've discovered that no matter how bad a mix you do, if you drop an air horn, <laughs> drop an air horn over the top, sounds great. <laughs> um, okay. Um, this is something we did at a workshop for TED. So this is the TED book for a couple of years ago. The attendees could stick one of our conductive ink stickers on top and then put the graphic on top, press the control module on. Then when you press a little button, it wakes up. We have an app. You open the app. Um, the app will pair with the book and then you have the experience so i'm just going to make that larger um a club isn't the best place to find the lovers of the bar is where i go mm -hmm. me and my friends at the table doing shots tripping fast and then we talk slow mm -hmm. come over and start up a conversation with just me and trust me i'll give it a chance now take my hand stop the so i've remixed the main loop we start to dance enough. i'm going to turn the volume down a little it's a little loud and then it has some one shots over the top. 
Uh, and yeah, and this is my remix of the main loop. And then I added in some other loops. And then um, the original loops from the track you can put back in. That's kind of fun. Um, yeah, so, so touching any of those touch points triggers loops and um, animations on the, on the smartphone app. And I'll show you one more thing. So this, we call this the, the, we call this the songwriter's notebook. And the idea is that a songwriter can be writing their song in the notebook. And then, of course, when they have an idea of how it sounds, they can fold out this beautiful foil stamped Bluetooth keyboard in the back, open an app, and then that pairs, and then I really wish I could play piano. If I could, I would play something beautiful right now, but I can't. Um, I just just create these things and I hope that um, people who can <laughs> play the piano can um, can have some fun with that. So the idea is um, it, it will record in the app um, anything that you play on there and it can record your voice too. So you can write your words or ideas for a song but then you can capture the sound just by tapping away on the back of the um, the back page of the notebook and this fold out Bluetooth keyboard. It's also MIDI, so it pairs with GarageBand, Ableton, Pro Tools, Logic, anything like that. So it's totally standard. Um, yeah, and it's kind of an example of the sort of things we want to create. We just want everyday objects around us to just have a little bit of something in them when you might need the tech to be there. Um, so. Let me think of what else we've done here. So um, a, a few months ago, Bootsy Collins um, reached out to me and he said, can you make a couple of things for me? Um, so I made a, an interactive pizza box and an interactive poster for Bootsy. And then he asked me to FedEx those to Jimmy Fallon, um, which I did. Um, and then to my surprise, Jimmy Fallon opened his show. Um, well, I'll just show you. Oh, hang on. Hey guys, uh, before we start the show tonight, uh, it's going to be a fun one, an interesting one. We asked our friend Bootsy Collins if he wanted to do anything for our show because we were a fan of Bootsy. Here's something he came up with, his, him and his friend Dr. Kate Stone. They invented this thing, so if you just press it now and then just hear... Jingle, jangle, looks like you got a ring on the bell, Funketeer. You... <laughs> so anyways, Bootsy is going to be in our show tonight. Also, we got a call last night that Bill Murray wants to come on and... Uh, <laughs> Um, it was it was really fun when I saw that. Um, so yeah, I, I, it was just kind of a little exciting to see something that I made here in the studio um, appear on TV like that, which was which was pretty awesome. What we've aimed to do though is use existing manufacturing processes, materials, and devices to enable magical user experiences and journeys. And we also want to democratize design. So for that reason, we created software tools along with um, easy to use prototyping methods to allow almost anyone to create one of these experiences. Um, that's really what we've, what we've aimed to do. So just taking one of the stickers, the circuit board, press them together using a simple app with some drop down lists. The idea is, is that anyone can can make anything magical and connected like this in, in just in a, in a very simple way. And we've taken that a step further by making sure that the tools that we use for prototyping are exactly what we use to manufacture anything at volume, meaning that when we want to go from a prototype or a one-off or a ten-off, we can very quickly go to something in, in, in volume. Um, I'll show you something else, um, just a, a video. So a few years ago, we had a design intern who created a beautiful poster using these tools and using, using these materials. Uh, 
I really love that. When I when I first saw it, it, it made me cry. <laughs> I just thought it was so beautiful, and it was so nice seeing someone take a platform that we've created and then make something out of it that was really beautiful, and then actually triggered my emotions. You know, and when I look at this, I kind of really see that that my skill is understanding a problem, and identifying how can I combine existing materials, tools, and methods to solve what might at first seem impossible whether that's moving sheep or moving electrons. And, you know, we believe that for a user experience to be magical, science and art must seamlessly blend together. And if science is the human understanding of how something in our natural world works, and art is our expression of how it looks and makes us feel, then perhaps art plus science equals nature. So when I look when I look at sort of technology, I see technology that's that's shrinking. Because a computer used to fill a room, then fill a desk, a lap, a palm, and now sits on our wrist. And we've reached a point where technology can fit inside nearly anything. In fact, someone once injected a chip into my hand. Um, and I still, apart from the one time when I opened a hotel door in Baltimore, um, I still haven't actually found a use for it. But it's in there. I can feel it. <laughs> and, and whilst design has many different styles, nostalgia often leads us to, to the design of products that look old fashioned. And so the combination of invisible technology and nostalgic design leads me to believe that the future may look more like the past than the present. More like the world of Merlin and, and Mary Poppins, where the ordinary becomes the extraordinary. So to understand our future, we really need to look at the past. And when I look back towards the origins of technology, I see a journey from simple tools to humans recreating fire, inventing the wheel, the plow, the printing press, communications and electronics. And I see a progression of removing friction from our lives. This increases our strength, keeps us safe and it connects our communities. But sadly, it also drives us towards convenience and away from traditional skills knowledge. And I believe we're now at a point where so much friction has been removed from our lives that we humans are almost surplus to requirement. Because think about it, if we need transport, a car just arrives, you know, we tap an app. We're hungry, we tap an app and food is delivered. And through those apps, we're always connected to the cloud and each other and our every single movement and moment is tracked. And whilst it's great to remove most friction, we need to ensure that we keep a healthy dose of it in our lives. Just for example, just growing or choosing ingredients for our food, cooking, walking to work, writing a letter or maybe chopping firewood. Because it's friction that makes each moment meaningful, mindful and memorable. What would our lives be like if all friction was removed? All friction's gone. W would you want to live in that future? So I'm going to bring in a guest. Um, hey, other Kate, <laughs> where are you? <laughs> Hi, yeah, so I'm out here on a hike in the Catskills, New York. We're talking about friction. What can you tell us? So I love to come out here hiking sometimes in the winter when it's minus five degrees Fahrenheit and I'll hike for something like eight hours deep into the woods and then I'll put up my hammock, spend an hour um, gathering wood, building a fire, boiling some water, making a cup of tea. And then when I sit down with that cup of tea, I say, why do I do this? I am terrified. Why did I not just stay at home, flick on the kettle and have a cup of tea on the couch? And it's then that I realised that this will probably be one of the very few cups of tea that I actually remember in my life. So I try to embrace friction to give my life more meaning and in just enjoy these wonderful wilderness journeys. 
Wow, enjoy that cup of tea. No, oh, thank you. Don't worry, I will do. Bye. Okay, wow. That's quite a journey. Um, you wouldn't catch me doing that. No way. <laughs> So clearly there's good friction and bad friction and removing any friction that helps keep us safe, removes genuine suffering, provides a quality of education or health and wealth. It's well worth pursuing. However, we need to identify, identify where to draw the line and because cross that line and I believe our mental health and general well-being will actually suffer. Okay. So now I want to talk a little trash. Um, last year I became horrified with how much trash I was creating in my home and I decided to tr change my diet to reduce my waste. So turning to the kitchen oracle, the trash can, um, I dug deep. I found soy milk cartons. tofu packets, plastic bags for bread, and the biggest offender of all, plastic cartons for salad. Plastic cartons for salad. Come on people, we can do better than this. Um, oh, and there was some uh, baked bean cans somewhere as well. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so there and then I decided to shop, cook and clean in a way that produces little to no waste. I kind of set myself a challenge because we become accustomed to thinking that it's normal to buy products wrapped in packaging. It is not normal. Lettuce in a plastic container is, is not normal. And I thought to myself, how difficult can it be? So I learned to make soy milk tofu, bread, um, seitan, hummus, I even started making my own baked beans, cakes um, and some lovely pastries because who does not love a cinnamon swirl and of course nothing nothing worked at the same time but I always persisted just like you know just like on that motorbike and I started to shop where I could put each item into a paper bag or no bag where I could fill my own containers from bulk with things like olive oil or peanut butter, sugar, spices. Um, I bought a flour mill, so I now even mill my own flour. And really, I, I realized that I was trying to shop um, and live in a way similar to how my grandparents did. And I actually started to feel closer to them, even though sadly they're no longer with us. And then COVID-19 hit, and I started to seriously consider food resilience. And what struck me was that my plant-based diet and the way that I'd begun shopping actually made me very resilient. So I was cooking most of my food from bulk dried ingredients, vegetables, the sort of vegetables that can be stored, and fresh greens. And then I realized that the biggest weakness was those fresh greens. So I actually set up a seed incubator. Um, this is a live stream. Um, I set up a seed incubator, um, a hydroponic system, um, and I'd never done this before. Um, and there is now um, kind of a jungle growing in the utility room. So this is a live stream from the utility room. Um, and I'm just going to go and run in there and show you. So I'll be right back. Hey, so I'm growing kale, lettuce, this basil smells lovely and there's coriander, dill, spinach, um, some of it's actually started growing out of the top and it's all um, has these LEDs and the hydroponic grow solution. On my way back. Um, so the thing is, if um, so long as I keep adding that grow solution, I will have a year's round supply um, of, of, of fresh greens. And it's been a really, really fun thing to experiment with. Um, 
very tasty as well and hopefully quite healthy so it made me sort of want to say don't be a prepper with a bunker of food that you'll never eat whilst living a wasteful lifestyle instead build resilience live every day meeting your needs by creating what you require whenever possible from what is around you and instead of you know recycling just don't create waste reuse or compost because all of these things become who you are and resilience it's a lifestyle it's not something that you store in a bunker and this whole experience it reminded me of my grandmother's advice something that I've tried to use in all the things I do how can I meet my needs using the resources closest to me I used to think it was about being frugal but I now know that if you cut your coat from the cloth at hand that whatever you create is far more likely to be fit for purpose when produced from its own environment with a kind of built-in resilience invention driven by necessity but fueled by resourcefulness so the technology that I've developed and the products we've created are kind of all built on that principle so why should I not use that same thinking with how I eat and how I live and it further resort it further reinforces it as a core principle in everything that I try to do and in shaping a vision for a future world that I really want to live in so having considered a little of our past and reflected on our future and explored how embrace friction develops resilience my my curiosity led me to ask who are we and and how how does how do we work because I wanted to understand the difference between our brain and our mind now clearly our brain is an organ mostly inside our head consisting of two connected halves left and right and so I started to wonder could our minds be similar to two halves with an inner mind in our body and an outer mind actually as our environment connected together via our five known senses to create a full mind when I ask someone where do you have your best ideas they'll often say in the shower or on a walk or I don't know maybe chewing a pencil so think about it if we use our environment to think and make decisions just like those sheep did then surely our environment must actually be a part of our mind would a spider without a web still be a spider and can we still be who we are without our surroundings so I love to hike and and, and when I walk through the forest I kind of imagine that I'm I'm the, I'm the needle on a record and that the trail is the groove in that record and that the friction that's created as I like step over rocks or duck under a branch or wade through a stream that friction generates thoughts in my head that are kind of like the music in my mind and when I stand on top of a mountain and take in the view I feel a flow of energy come into my whole body from wherever I place my attention and I visualize field lines of different colors flowing into me and each of them represents a sense with a width that corresponds to the amount of information the sight of the sky or the stars the smell and taste of the air the sound of animals and weather and the feeling of air or heat on my skin and and the moment on that mountain when I feel absolutely insignificant is also the moment when I feel a part of everything that I am the universe and have the potential to be a part of the ultimate mind now as we walk down the street our senses kind of detect our environment with a constant flow of data coming into our inner mind and and this allows us to maintain our journey with our auto collision antenna 
kind of magically ensuring that we don't bump into each other through these subtle course corrections that we might not even notice. But as soon as we pull this thing out of our pocket, all of those field lines bend in to the phone with just sight and sound remaining. And we, we lose our connection to our outer mind. People bump into each other, walk into lampposts, and even fall down holes. But that stuff really happens. <laughs> so have you ever wondered what the inside of your mind might look like or what it would be like to read someone else's mind? Well, if our environment is our mind, then just looking at the environment someone lives or works in, builds, creates or travels through, can actually be a glimpse into their mind. Bringing you into my studio is kind of like bringing you into my mind. You know, this place is my mind and everything out there around me is my mind. And I, I like to say, if you don't like the music that that record is playing in your mind, then try just changing the record such as changing your environment and the people or the objects or the journeys that you take through your environment. And then taking that further, consider what this means when we design homes, hospitals, schools, and prisons. How often do we consider that when we design a space, place, object, or journey, that we're actually designing the inside of people's minds? And I've started to consider this as I develop technology develop products <clears throat> and think about think about the actual purpose of my work and if you want to know what the inside of your mind looks like then just take a walk into the forest or up a mountain look at the sky and just see how beautiful the inside of your mind actually is so in fairness my parents probably bought me that one-way ticket to expand my mind. And it only really became one way because my curiosity led me to stay longer, let the return leg, leg lapse, and explore areas of my mind that only existed on the other side of the world. And once I had the realization that my environment is my mind, that what is around me is who I am, that all of our minds actually overlap, making us one, it became very difficult to see the world how I saw it before. In much the same way, I couldn't unhear after my childhood eavesdropping with that radio transmitter in the bedroom. <laughs> a little drink of water. <clears throat> so, thinking, um, thinking of ham radios, um, oh, sorry, thinking of radios, I wanted to talk about communication and my ham radio. Um, I'm sure you've all been on a call and you're kind of in the middle of your flow when you're cut off by someone's urgent desire to deliver their opinion right there and then when that was their time to be listening. Like it made me wonder what happened, what happened to the art of communication? Well, a year ago, um, I was encouraged by some preppers that I'd met in the forest and I bought my first ham radio. And I was mostly mic shy on, until COVID-19 hit. And then I joined a local club who run a repeater that sits on top of a nearby mountain. And it transmits at 146.805 megahertz. And every morning at 8.35, Paul, AC2UQ, puts out a call for a friendly QSO, or conversation, that's affectionately become known as the 8.35 on the 8.05. And when Paul, AC2UQ, puts out the call, he does not know who is going to join. This frequency in use is this frequency in use. This is AC2 UQ, Alpha Charlie 2, Uniform, Quebec. You, my name is Paul, transmitting from New Paltz. If you have an FCC call sign, please call now. With that call sign, your name and your QTH. Please come now. PLS, and one by one we respond with our call signs and our QTH, which is our location, in a kind of polite but random order. And he creates the running order from whomever checks in. 
Kitty 2 RYD, this is Kate in Glenford above the show cam. Good morning uh, to you all. So uh, Nick, Katie 2 RBR is here, and then uh, we'll have Jim, K2BHM. Uh, Jim, if you'll then turn it over to Guy. Ham radio is actually over 100 years old, and I like to think of it as one of the oldest forms of electronics-based social media, which was preceded by Morse code over telegraph. And the thing is, on the radio, when you press the push to talk, you can't hear anyone else. So the only way we can hold a conversation is by following a protocol. And each of us takes a few minutes to speak, one to three minutes, and then passes what we kind of call the candle onto the next person until we've all spoken. And because of the limited technology, it creates a friction that ensures we have to practice the art of listening. And in fact, we listen far more than we speak. And if you have an immediate thought you want to share, write it down, wait your turn. And maybe someone else will answer it or you'll realize it wasn't actually that urgent. And in the last few months, of morning QSOs with faceless strangers. It's been one of the most delightful things, honestly, I've ever experienced. So I've learned to listen more than I speak and to ensure that every voice has its time to be heard and that together, no matter who we are or who turns up, a community is built when we all learn to connect, respect and listen to each other. So to wrap up, my early years were filled with a playful curiosity, creating magical experiences, developing resourcefulness and a growing understanding of the concept of allowing without commanding. And at Novalia, the company I started 15 years ago, we've exploited the pervasiveness of print and printing whilst using what is around us to create experiences with everyday objects that might be more at home in Merlin's laboratory or Mary Poppins's carpet bag. And my journeys through the forest have taught me to embrace friction and that too much technology is actually detrimental to our mental health. We need to ask, how can we better balance convenience with necessity and use technology to create more mindful, meaningful and memorable experiences? Standing on the top of mountains has given me an insight into my mind and, and a feeling that we are our environment. How can a more subtle use of embedded technology allow us to be gently informed, guided or have emotions triggered? while still maintaining the connection between our inner and outer minds. And listening to a combination of my grandmother and the trash can helped me discover resilience and see that maybe to survive the zombie apocalypse, we might not need much technology at all. Could just stripping back to a simpler way of living enable us to be healthier, safer, more connected and kinder to each other, whilst at the same time treating the environment with more respect. And can I please live in a house where all my food is growing on the walls? I would love that. <laughs> and my accidental journey into ham radio helped me recognise that sometimes old-fashioned, low-fidelity technology with delightful friction can actually provide us with a with a richer, more human experience that allows us to build community and take advantage of what we all bring to the table when every voice is heard. And all of these personal experiences in my life so far have given me an insight into the future that, that I want to build both personally and with the technology my team and I develop. And in my own small way, it helps me wonder, how can I use a little modern day alchemy to transmute the ordinary into the extraordinary? Or just embrace the ordinary and all its natural potential. I hope that some of my journeys and insights allow you to see aspects of your life in a different light. Perhaps, maybe even challenge the concept of who you are. And if so, 
may you never be able to see the world the same again. <laughs> I've been Kate, KD2 RYD, Kilo Delta 2, Romeo Yankee Delta, and from my QTH, I will say 73 and clear on your final. Bye.